So, Sultan uh, Al-Qasmi here gives me, a, gives me great pleasure to be on the stage again with Dina Takruri, who I follow uh, almost religiously uh, on various platforms. So, Dina is a host and producer. For those, for the one or two of you who doesn't know, Dina is a host and producer with AJ Plus, the Al Jazeera Channel's all digital news network based in San Francisco. Uh, the videos that, they, uh, that she hosts range in format from in studio explainers big news stories, interviews with experts, stakeholders, and ground reports from where news is breaking. Her videos have gone viral, millions of views on Facebook and hundreds of thousands on YouTube. I believe a couple of videos have up to how many viewers? Personally? Seven, 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 seven million. Okay, seven million views on a platform that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how young this platform is in a couple of minutes. So. Amongst the uh, events and the uh, news items that Dina covered were, and you might have heard of the uh, wildlife reserve uh, uh, occupation in, uh, in Oregon, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, uh, Euro the uh, Europe's refugee crisis, which is really a Middle East refugee crisis, and uh, you know, in the West Bank as, as recently as a few months ago. Before joining AJ+, Dina was with HuffPost Live and uh, Al Jazeera. <laughs> Okay, well, a little bit about AJ Plus. Who here has heard of AJ Plus and follows their news? Well done. Who hasn't? Who hasn't heard? Okay, well, this session is exactly for you, both of you guys. <laughs> okay? So, uh, so, AJ Plus is a very young channel. I think you guys uh, started uh, broadcasting in September or so, 2014. Yeah, that was our official launch. Okay, we're going to talk about this because it's very interesting. And uh, the channel was sort of created a, a year before. It broadcasts in three languages. English, Arabic, and what's the third language? Yes, okay. Espanol. Espanol, well done. Okay, we're gonna talk about that as well. Uh, so it's, it's uh, obviously, uh, it has a 600% engagement uh, rise on, uh, on Facebook. What does that mean? So that means, uh, so engagement is something that's actually really valued at AJ+. Um, it's more than just a buzzword. What engagement on Facebook means is that uh, for as many likes as we have per page, now we have 4 million, but we started out much smaller. There's 600%, our videos reach 600% of that. So not just the 4 million, much, much more, which is, okay. which is excellent for us. Oh, great, okay. So, um, and, and finally, uh, in October 2015, so just five months, six months ago, AJ Plus announced that they had reached over 1 billion views across all platforms. So this is a billion views for a channel that didn't exist two years ago. A billion eyeballs. And I have an update actually. Yeah. At the end of 2015, it was 2.2 billion. Now it's 3 billion. Wow. So 3 billion. 3 billion. Three. Is this news that we're breaking here at STEP? I think, I don't think it's breaking, but okay. yeah. You have, your, you have your STEP exclusive. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, so there's two kinds of videos on AJ+. Plus. For those of you who, for the three of people who don't follow AJ+, Plus, okay. There's, three, there's two kinds of videos. One uh, is the text-heavy animation, short clips that you call... We call it real time, which real is time. the news, basically. And then there's the other kind that Dina sort of uh, produces and appears in, which you guys call... Uh, we call that editorial team context. So those okay. are like two, three minute explainer-based news. Okay. Um, we call it context. And then we also we have short documentaries as well. Yes, yes. okay, great. So that's a third type. Okay, well, uh, so, so the session here is why is video dominating our feed? Let's just take a quick poll from the audience. How many of you get their news from traditional news sources? Traditional newspapers and TV channels. Okay, that's not bad, about seven people or so from a room of about 150 or so. How many of you, obviously, get your news from new media? New media, hands up, don't be shy, okay. Okay, well, obviously you're at home, you're, uh, you know. Familiar territory. So why is video dominating our feeds? What's the deal? Why are there four or five people getting their news from, from the newspapers and regular channels and the rest are getting their news from you guys? And the rest, you know, the, for a statistic here, six out of 10 American millennials get their news exclusively from Facebook or predominantly from Facebook. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we didn't originally intend it to be that way. I've been with AJ Plus now for two and a half years. So there was a year of just piloting, basically, figuring out what this channel was, who are we, what's our tone, who are we speaking to. And what I had originally signed up to do was be part of a YouTube channel. 
Uh, we soft launched in the June of 2014, and by soft launch, I mean we, you know, we started a Facebook page, we started a YouTube presence, we rolled out Twitter, we started putting videos out. And um, the big story that time, of that time during that summer was the Gaza War. So we were producing a lot of videos on YouTube. Around that time, Facebook introduced a new feature, which is natively uploading videos. And you know, instead of just posting, copy and pasting a YouTube link onto Facebook, we started natively uploading there. And Facebook in turn started prioritizing and favoring uh, publishers who did that, big time. And so- Why? It's, I mean, it's, it's, you're scrolling through your feed and all of a sudden you see a video and it automatically plays and you're gonna watch it, it grabs people in. Um, and so that, you know, for the past, I guess, year and a half, two years, they've really been favoring that. And that's why you see so many videos, not just AJ+, even some of our competitors who look similar to us, of course they're different, um, dominating your feeds. It's something that, you know, Facebook is always switching, and I can't speak on behalf of Facebook, but from what I understand is they're always kind of uh, experimenting with what they want to do and what they're, you know, what, they're, what they want to prioritize in your feed. The longest time it was natively uploaded videos, it still is to a large extent. Facebook Live, which allows anyone to broadcast live from their cell phones, which we've done recording in the field, and even individuals are doing now, that's becoming huge on Facebook. Um, instant article is another thing. The idea is that people don't want to click outside. You're in Facebook, you want the entire experience to be there, whether it's the videos that you're watching or the article that you're reading. Instant article is something they've introduced where you don't have to click out and go to an external site to read you know, a BBC article. You can read it right in there. So what they do basically is that they concentrate all your internet experience on their platform. They want you to read your articles on their platform. It's smart because it means that you're engaging on their website longer, which means that they can you know, charge people for uh, advertising, advertisements and, and other uh, features. Uh, how many of you, uh, you know, let's say, don't really like the fact that videos play automatically when, when you're scrolling? How many of you think a lot? How many of you like the fact that the videos play automatically? So see, there's actually uh, uh, there is a, uh, a tendency to, to view them unless you're on uh, a very expensive Wi-Fi, and then you're in trouble. Uh, I want to talk about something Dina just said. The fact that they were working for almost a year and a half before launching the channel, they were producing videos. Did you produce videos? Yeah, for, oh yeah. For a year and a half? Yeah, we, before we, we, you launched. we there were so many videos. We used to joke like, oh, when are we gonna launch? Here goes yet another video that but nobody's gonna see. Good quality video or video? Good quality video. I mean, okay. we are constantly evolving based on the industry, based on what we see, what works online, what best resonates. So we started out as a team of like, I don't know, 10 people piloting, mm -hmm. making videos. A lot of them were, you know, these two, three minute animated explainers. And at the time we were also kind of grappling with, who are we? What is this channel? Who are we targeting? You know, are we talking to 12th graders, high schoolers, or are we talking to our peers? Eventually we defined all of that and that helped us, you know, figure out our tone. Uh, we have defined our audience primarily to be an American millennial audience, young people who are globally minded, who care about the world, who care about the news. And what we're trying to do is make them care even more. What, what's the millennial, by the way? Millennial, I believe, is 18 to 34. Okay. But I've been hearing that for a few years, so we might be a little bit older now. Okay, it's like who, between 1980 and something. Who here is a millennial by Dina's definition? Hands up if you're a millennial. Okay. Who here isn't a, maybe a little bit older than, than, than a millennial? It's not that we don't want you to watch yeah. the video, so absolutely, you guys, you guys count yeah. too. We're, we're sti we still like you guys, we, yeah. we want you to be a part of this. So, uh, but the question really is, is the launch of AJ Plus and other similar channels, is it basically a reflection uh, of the shortening attention spans of uh, audiences? I think, I think the shortening of attention spans is something that's real, but here I want to clarify that even though AJ Plus has been around for about two years and we piloted for a year before that, the actual idea came about in 2010. And it came about from uh, a department within Al Jazeera in Doha called Innovation and Incubation. And these guys' mandate is to look at the industry and see what's going on. And they identified the fact that consumer habits when it comes to news are changing and that more people are looking at to the digital space to get their news. So that's where the idea came about, but it didn't come to fruition a little bit later. Um, in terms of shorter attention spans, that is a reality. And I wouldn't say that we're necessarily catering to people's short attention spans. Yes, there are a lot of competing things out, out there online and you know we, we want your attention too. I think what we recognize is how to optimize a video and the production of a story in order to get the most eyeballs on it. So one reality is that one to two minutes, maybe three max, that's what works on Facebook. 
people don't want to watch any bit longer. We're also on YouTube. That is a big platform for us as well. And we put out some of our longer content, our documentaries that I mentioned that are up to 10 minutes on YouTube. Uh, so. The documentaries, by the way, for those of you born in the 70s like me, they used to be 50 minutes long. Now they're 10 minutes long. Who Short here? Docs. <laughs> Short docs. Short docs. Short so so he, who here uh, believes that the attention span is shortening for younger generation? So, uh, sorry to keep pushing this, but how short is short attention span? Do you, like, is, is 30 seconds to one minute what you guys think is the uh, okay period? 60 seconds, up to 60 seconds, I think yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, that's where people, you, you know, you, you, you give people what they want and they want shorter documentaries. Yeah. But does it impact quality? You know, I don't, think, I don't think it does impact quality. I think we're constantly striving to tell important stories and tell them, you know, in the most engaging, captivating way with the most, you know, kind of arresting visuals that resonate with you. So um, I, I would say, you know, maybe for other publishers, that's something that they do. At the end of the day, we're Al Jazeera, so we have a commitment to telling stories that matter. And we have a lot of editorial principles that we hold true to. Of course, if you're a journalist coming from, you know, doing longer format stuff or writing long, long articles and all of a sudden you have to condense it into like a 30 second video. That's something that you might grapple with. But I say, you know, I think we've, we've, we've gotten used to doing it in a way where we cram the necessary information in there and you walk away learning something new. Because you also include uh, text, yes. you include uh, graphics, yeah. uh, graphs, yeah. uh, pie charts. No. Uh, I would say, um, maybe pie charts, but that, that is um, our, our most common videos. The ones we publish the most are in that format, that real-time format. You know, it's kind of, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Visualizing uh, Palestine yeah, project. Uh, who, hands up who's heard of Visualizing Palestine. So it's sort of similar in a, in a sense where they're using heavy on animation, heavy on graphics. Yeah. I think, and, and the audience might also be uh, the same. By the way, it's such a beautiful view. You guys have no idea how great you look, seriously. <laughs> I'll be taking a picture of these guys in a minute. So, uh, let's shake it up a little bit. Enough boring questions. Let's talk about a serious question right now. So, how do you pitch stories? Do you come up with a story yourself? Because I'm going to ask you about that story. Uh, that story. That That's story. the most recent story. Yes. Um, it's very collaborative. Uh -huh. uh, producers are constantly pitching stories. And we also have a team that we call Engagement, whose uh, you know, responsibility is to look at what's happening in the social space, look at what the conversations are on Twitter, on Facebook, how people are discussing the news, and oftentimes we'll formulate stories about that. Because as I said earlier, engagement is something that we care about a lot at the channel. It's more than just a buzzword. And for us, engagement is creating content and telling the news in a way that drives conversations, that has people talk about them. Because what we've seen and what we're you know, constantly demonstrating is that it's no longer a situation where news is just a one-way thing. I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an anchor sitting at a desk talking at you. For us, it's two-way. It's like a feedback loop with our viewers. We speak in their language. We speak in their slang. You know, uh, sometimes we'll throw in funny memes and stuff like that. So a lot of it is, you know, sometimes yeah. Of course, I pitch a lot of stories. Uh, I'm a presenter producer at the end of the this day. Is the question I'm going to ask you: Did you pitch that story? Which story? This, that that story. Are you talking about APAC? Yes. Oh yeah. So I did pitch that story. So, you pitched it. Okay. Uh, Israel Palestine is something that I've covered a lot since okay. I got to AJ Plus from the start of the Gaza war until now. Okay. Um, it's partly it, it, due to the fact that I am Palestinian, you know, born and raised in the United States, but grew up, hey, <laughs> okay, the Palestinians in the house. Um, you know, I grew up, was born and raised in San Francisco, actually grew up with my mom taking my sister and I to the occupied West Bank in the summers throughout my whole life. That really formulated a consciousness for me. And uh, the prism through which I see so many issues in our world today that deal with justice and injustice. So growing up Palestinian-American, watching American news and watching how Palestinians are constantly dehumanized. And not just Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, everything. Um, for me, minorities that, in general. Minorities in general, yeah. but for me that really fueled the passion to want to, to, want to do this right. Okay. To want to, you know, to tell what the mainstream media isn't telling about Palestinians. Yeah. A story I've covered for a long time. We knew that the APAC convention is coming up. And, and to, to take after his tactics, raise your hand if you know what APAC is. For those who don't, APAC is the American Israel um, Public Affairs Committee. It is the pro-Israel lobby in the United States. And it is one of the most powerful special interest groups, one of the most powerful lobbies. Um, a couple of weeks ago in Washington, DC, they had their annual convention, which drew 18,000 people. 18,000. Uh, 18,000 people. They say two-thirds of Congress attends. And every single US presidential candidate went there to speak. They took a break from campaigning, and they went to go speak to the pro-Israel lobby, except for Bernie Sanders, who incidentally is the Jewish American candidate. Who, yeah. Uh, 
uh, people here for feeling the burn, huh? Um, I'm feeling the burn. Wait, wait, wait. Before you, before you continue, who here hasn't seen Dina's uh, report from APAC? Who hasn't seen it? Okay, <clears throat> shame on you. <clears throat> no. Okay, That's fine. so. So tell us about uh, tell us about the impact. First of all, you're Palestinian. You're working for a Middle East-based channel. You're applying for media credentials to go cover a pro-Israel event. Yeah. How the hell did you get approval? Either they <laughs> respect the platform that is AJ Plus and they know our reach within America is huge, and they said, okay, let's credential them, or they just didn't, you know, they didn't do the research. And I didn't do anything non-factual. You know, I. Uh, so we went there, we, they credentialed myself and my producer and a cameraman and we went inside, inside the pro-Israel lobby and it was fascinating and it was also frightening and, and we did three videos out of there. The first video, um, we were, the news was that every single candidate was there except for Bernie Sanders. Um, so one video was asking the attendees there, well what do you think about the fact that the one candidate who's not here is the Jewish American candidate? Like what does that say to you? Um, and a lot of them were just like, you know, the worst kind of Jew is a Jew that doesn't support other Jews and shame on him and this was a, this was a wonderful opportunity that he passed up. You know, and I would challenge them and say, well, you actually, when it comes to American Jews, Jews polled around the country, Israel is not a top issue for them. The economy is, healthcare is, you know, social inequality is more so than Israel. But the, that, same, the same issues that, that the average American is. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely, but they, they weren't having it. So, and, and him not being there is also very consistent with his message of not wanting to be beholden to special interests. Mm. Um, he did offer a video message, they said no, and then he released a speech that was, uh, way better than any candidate on Israel because what, the re what happened with the rest of the presidential candidates is just that they, they went and they pandered so hard that one thing I said in my video is that you would think they were uh, running for office in Israel. Israel yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, we did, so we did the Bernie Sanders video. We also did a video where we talked to attendees on the third day of this policy conference. They actually go and lobby. So they bust them by the hundreds if not thousands to Capitol Hill. And each What's of them, Capitol Hill? Capitol Hill is uh, basically where our Senate and our Congress is, our, all the elected officials of the legislative uh, branch in the United States. Um, so they have their APAC talking points, which are three asks. You know, number one is about Iranian aggression. Number two is to reject any sort of UN resolution to, like, a, a, a resolution to the conflict. And number three is the memorandum of understanding between the U.S. and Israel to keep the aid coming and, and all that stuff. So all these people are really prepped up. They're so, so prepped. Should... Uh, so prepped okay. and so on point and they know their talking points and they go and they ask their congressman, you know, who's keep supporting Israel. Okay. Um, so, so, two yeah, questions. Yeah. So, uh, how many views did get, these videos get? Uh, the, the last one, which was sort of uh, me kind of giving my reflections, mm -hmm. was it's almost at 4 million. I 4 think, million. million. So on this Facebook. Is, on yeah, Facebook. this is a great example of the journalists sort of pitching the idea to their network and saying, you know what, this is something I think is going to get a lot of viewers. So. So I, I imagine that uh, you know you're very pleased with with the four million views. So. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. Well, congratulations to you, Thank you. And, and congratulations for you know for getting into APAC. And I really do hope you you are able to cover it once again uh, uh, next year if APAC ceases to exist. That might be better. But um, let's see what else is my up uh, next question. So. Uh, yeah, okay, well, so, you know, people, sensationalists like me, they want to attract your attention, they post things, and so people to fight over them. How important is the vi virality? Is virality a word? How important is what? The virality, the viral factor. Oh, viral factor. Yes. Um, it's important. Look, online, your metrics are the numbers, right? Okay. Um, we don't currently monetize. It's something that we're looking into doing. Yeah. But, you which know, means I, you don't monetize, which means that you don't ask people to pay to view the video. Right. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for other outlets and stuff, of, like in the same way that television, your ratings and your views or whatever, you see the metrics there online. You see how many people like, you see how many people comment, you see how many people share. That's something we play, pay close attention to too. It's not like the be all end all goal, but uh, it is, It is. ultimately you want to do work that people see and that's but, me. But could virality, could going viral or the, the viral factor, could yes. that impact on the quality? Let's ask the audience first. So uh, do, you, do you click on videos of cats and uh, you know, like, so cat videos. I do too. So okay. okay. Cat videos. Well, okay. Well, let's let's change let's change the question. Yeah. So 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 what what what, should, what question should I ask them about that viral? What, 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 what are we trying to get at here? We're so trying to get at how important is sort of the sensationalist uh, element. 
you guys really click on, on news website, news items that are sort of sensationalist, like, you won't believe what this guy did when he did, you know, saw his wife. I think he's asking about clickbait, which is something I wouldn't say that we do. Okay. We don't, we don't like put out things so that we can, you know, get as many clicks as possible. We might really think about the language of the video, like our Facebook one-liner. Every video is shared with a description. And obviously we want to write the description in a way that gets the most people interested to watch. We want to package our videos. We know that on Facebook, for example, and I don't want you guys to think we exclusively publish on Facebook. We're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, we have, we're on Medium, we have various different platforms. The biggest one right now currently is Facebook. But we learn how to optimize our video production in order to get the most views, as I said earlier. First five seconds are crucial, so we might put the best elements, the best visuals. You know, or maybe a text or a question at the very top to get the most people watching. So if the, fi if the first five seconds are interesting, chances are people will stick around. Yeah. Okay. And we also do things like, you know, we put subtitles on so that you don't have to listen to audio because a lot of people will watch our videos when they're, you know, in a meeting okay. or on the subway and they can't listen to it. But you're not supposed to watch videos when you're in meetings. Yeah, but Except I mean, as in, in terms of like, do you click on something because it has a lot of shares and stuff? I think we're in this age where you look at, there's a lot of social uh, consuming going on. So you share things a lot, so fun, and I will read them or click on them just because you did. And that, after you do like five more friends do, and you see, well, oh, 10 of my friends on my timeline have shared this, it must be important, let me watch it. So I think that contributes to the viral factor in a lot of ways. It's kind of like looking at what, what people, who, what, like people you trust and what they're putting out. Okay, well, um, who here considers uh, uh, herself or himself to be a citizen journalist sometimes. Sometimes being a citizen journalist. So that's about, let's say about 10% of you, I mean, you know, you take a picture, it gets on, it, it gets on to one of the TV channels. I suppose that's some kind of citizen journalism. How much of citizen journalism makes it to uh, AJ Plus? I would say a good amount, a good amount does. And the interesting thing about this day and age is that all of us who have mobile phones are content creators in our own right. Um, we do use a lot of user-generated content in our videos. We also use a lot of tweets, you know, tweets are the new vox box, as we say, like instead of going on the street and asking people sometimes, we'll get a sense of what, 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 you know, what the conversations and what the opinions in the world out there are based on tweets. We subscribe to a service called Storyful. And what Storyful does is they mine the social web for a lot of these um, you know, user-generated videos that people did, and they verify them for us, and they clear the rights and everything so that we can then use them. And so I think what we have done, because citizen journalism has been around for a long time, what we've done is sort of augment it, we've added to it, and we contextualize it. You know, we'll take a video that somebody shot, we'll add some context around it, and you know, in that sense, we sort of endorse it. And a great example of this is, um, you know, the police brutality in the United States is a story that we've long covered and we continue to cover a long time. If it wasn't for these people that are documenting how the police disproportionately target, you know, African Americans and they're filming these things, these, you know, cops pulling people over, cops beating people up. If it wasn't for people filming that, then, then maybe the converse, the national consciousness around police brutality and institutionalized racism wouldn't be as big as it is today. But we use that, that type of citizen journalism a lot to elevate the conversation. Well, having said that, you know, uh, regular people, I think, going into conflict zones, there's a lot of, uh, there's an element of, of danger, basically. There's a, a number of times where people who have gone into conflict zones have got hurt or kidnapped. So maybe there's an element here of also field work, especially for journalists. I, I want to ask you, because you, you, were, you were a seasoned journalist. You, you, did, you did reporting uh, before AJ+. Plus. How important is field work in this industry? I think it's important, and a lot of what I had done ahead of time was, was primarily studio-based. I was a producer uh, for Al Jazeera Arabic. I was a producer and I hosted at HuffPost Live at, at the Huffington Post. And it's actually, uh, that's probably Ahmed Shahab Adin saying, because he worked there as well. And it's actually, uh, it's a conversation that he and I were having yesterday, because he's now a correspondent at Vice, and he's all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I was asking him, like, do you miss sort of like just doing the studio interviews that we used to do? And he said no, and he said, I've grown this past year in ways I never have before. And I feel the same as they're increasingly sending me out. I mean, for me, part of what it means to be a journalist is that human interaction and being outside and talking to people and challenging people and humanizing people. And you don't do that unless you're in the field. An example is um, the, the refugee crisis is something that I covered a lot in studio at AJ Plus, doing the um, explainers and you know talking about it from the studio. It wasn't until I actually went to Europe at the height of the crisis and 
traveled with refugees and walked with them and got stuck at borders with them and camped at them, that you re I really understood the magnitude of this crisis, you know? And I think even for the viewer to, you know, for the viewers that have come to know me and trust me and, and look at me as a source of their news, to actually see me experimenting, experiencing it with them, I think it takes it to another level. And I hope that it makes it, you know, the situation I hope resonates with them a lot more because of it, so. Um, so I want to talk about a story that took place here in the UAE. There was an incident where a person was driving, uh, sort of, um, you know, really shocking, and, and he beat up this other gentleman, and a person filmed it on video and uploaded the, the video. Let me just check who's familiar with the story. Okay, let's see, because we are on home ground. So a local guy was beating up a non-local guy, let's put it that way. Okay, very, very bad, 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 awful. But what was really shocking, in addition to the, to the, to the sort of uh, uh, aggression, is the fact that the person who uploaded the video was called in to the police. And so it's important here to keep in mind that, you know, you just can't film people and upload the video. And I believe that, and I'm not, I'm not in the uh, 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 legal uh, field, but I believe that there are rights to, you know, victims, they also have rights. You know, if, I, if somebody was beating me up, which I think is gonna happen sometime very soon, and, you know, I wouldn't want my mom, for instance, or my family to be, to be seeing that video or myself to be seeing that video. So, so keep that in mind that you can't just go somewhere and film somebody. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's gonna be a lot of new situations, especially with the advent of like Facebook Live and Periscope, which we also use a lot, which is broadcasting live through Twitter. I'm, I, we're gonna see more situations where people capture things like a shooting or like something that a t normal TV news would cut away from, but it's gonna be there and it's gonna present a whole new host of of, of, of challenges, I think, for those of us in news. Uh, pro tip, if you see shooting, do not approach and film. This is but at the same time, I think these are tools for holding power accountable. Like, if you are filming a police officer, obviously abusing a citizen, that should be filmed, I think, in the context of the United States, as I'm saying. So, yeah, keeping, keeping those accountable. So we had an incident here a few, uh, few months ago where there was a fire at the hotel in Dubai, and uh, a uh, citizen journalist, I suppose, uh, from a Middle Eastern country was filming through Periscope. Are you guys familiar with that gentleman? Have you seen that video during the fire? No, nobody's seen it. Well, he had thousands, he remembers that, the one guy remembers. So the others don't live in Dubai. Really. So uh, what happened was that somebody used Periscope and, yeah. and was filming and he had thousands of views and it went viral all over the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are, in addition to Facebook, there's all these new platforms. You talked about Twitter and there's Periscope now. Do you yeah. guys use Periscope? Absolutely, we use it a lot, yeah. It, um, sometimes we go live on Periscope, sometimes we go live on Facebook. Uh, and I think it's excellent, I think a lot of times you're seeing people who are broadcasting live beat the cable news and beat, you know, traditional news channels who would have to drive out there and, you know, launch their expensive satellite equipment too. So it's definitely, uh, it's quite revolutionary. Time check. Another question, minute and a half? A minute and a half? A minute and a half. What am I going to do with this? An entire minute and a half with Dina Takrori on stage. Oh okay, well, uh, one of the uh, latest uh, uh, news, uh, I think inadvertent news websites in the Middle East, I think known as sort of a, uh, a uh, youngster's platform is Snapchat. But today, Snapchat is used here in the Gulf and the Middle East as a news source. We have a very popular user in, in the Gulf called Sheikh Majid al Sabah who does a lot of videos. Are you guys familiar with his account? He, yeah, so uh, the same guy basically who was uh, watching all the, yeah, talk to that guy by the way, he's really good. So uh, someone hire him. So uh, do you guys use Snapchat? We're looking to get into that space. Okay. It's, definitely, it's definitely an important space to be in as much as I resisted it from the start. And they designed that stuff to complicate older people. <laughs> that stuff is not intuitive whatsoever. I think they're fixing it. Um, but I think, yeah, increasingly, uh, uh, Facebook is even seeing Snapchat as a competitor now when it comes to video and when it comes to messaging. And it is, I think, we're gonna see it being used as a news tool more and more, so more and more, I think. I've been in situations where, you know, I've been at like a democratic debate, and you know how on Snapchat you can contribute to a story, a news story, and then you see how different people um, basically curated from, from different perspectives. So I've posted videos from things from my vantage point that have then went to the story, and you see like, 40,000 views or more, so. Uh, so last, last question, what should uh, traditional news sources do to keep up with you know, the millennials and Snapchat generation? Um, I think 
uh, I think they need to, like digital strategy and posting stuff online, it's not as simple as just, okay, I have this news package that I put on TV, now I'm gonna put it online. It, it doesn't work like that. You need to uh, know what works for each platform. You need to natively produce for each platform and uh, put some serious investment in that, I think. Great, wonderful. Thank you very much, Dina Takaluri. Thank you so much.